the older generation was telling me, you want to be a marine biologist? You think you're going to be Jacques Cousteau? Well, you, you, you'll never make it, you know. But so it goes to show you, you know, sometimes you should just follow your dreams. So I, I guess in a way, you know, I, I go fishing. I love the, uh, I'm very inquisitive about what's going on there. Uh, as I'm fishing and and uh, um, and then depicting the the animals and my jewelry, I guess I am kind of a marine biologist. That was Tom Tietze with his marine biologist story, trout rings, fish jewelry, and the artisan workshop today on the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how you doing today? Thank you for stopping by the show. Before we get into this one, please uh, share this episode or any past episodes if you get a chance. If you know somebody who wants to break in and learn a few tips and tricks and hear some stories, click that share button and uh, copy that link and share it out. Thank you in advance if you've had a chance to share this episode today or down the line. Established in 1928, Deddy Flies is the oldest family-run fly shop in the country, now in their 94th season. Deddy's mission has always been to supply the fly fishing community with the finest products and services. Every fly they sell is either tied in-house or by a handful of select tires. You can head over to wetflyswing.com slash Deddy, that's D-E-T-T-E, to grab your flies today. That's wetflyswing.com slash Deddy. Rare Gear makes truly unique and innovative fishing gear to help you travel lighter, faster, and fish more often. This telescoping fly rod doesn't need guides and packs up small enough to fit in the pocket of your backpack. This is likely the most unique rod you've seen this year, so you're going to have to take a look for yourself. You can go to Rare Gear right now. That's R-E-Y-R gear.com to check out one of the most unique rods right now that's rare r-e-y gear.com tom tizza rhymes with pizza the man behind the artisan workshop is here to share his fish passion story and jewelry tom is here to break down some of his most popular brook trout rings some of the steelhead rings and his spawning salmon jewelry and some different types of metals you should be thinking about if you're in the market for a ring or jewelry. Uh, Some really interesting stuff here today. I'm excited to jump into this one right now. So without further ado, here is Tom Tietze from the Artisan Workshop. How's it going, Thomas? Very well, thank you, Dave. You actually even pronounced my name correctly. Most people don't get that right. That's right. That's right. Well, it's the, uh, I'm not sure. I can't remember what they call those things, but when you, uh, you know, you can't pronounce name, but somebody says it's uh, it's pizza instead of pizza. You know what I, I love would would guests do that for me because, because I, uh, I love those. And some, one of our listeners will have to reach out and tell me what that's called. Or do you know what that's called when you, when you do that with the words? Oh, I don't know. I should know, but I don't. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I think it's a mnemonic device. That might be what it is. Mnemonic device, potentially. Um, so anyways, uh, we're going to get into fish jewelry. You've got a bunch of cool rings with like trout and salmon and jewelry, all sorts of stuff. And we're going to dig into that today. So maybe you could just take us back. I know uh, you do a little bit of fishing out there. Maybe you just talk about how you found yourself, um, you know, kind of doing the jewelry. I know you did, uh, it sounds like a long career, but how'd you get yourself into fish jewelry? Well, as a, um, as a kid, I was fishing ponds around the San Francisco Bay Area, which I uh, credit for keeping me out of trouble while I was in junior high school. I was out there pretty much every other afternoon fishing for bass. And uh, so I I developed a love for fishing and nature and and those creatures around the pond. And then uh, when I was 18, I started out with a friend of mine who was cutting opals uh, and just playing around in his garage, uh, f- we found ourselves working together, making some simple jewelry. And then at an arts and crafts fair, when I was, I think, 19 or so, uh, I had a bunch of his stuff stolen from me. And I thought it was the end of the world, but uh, I had to repay him. I actually dropped out of college. Um, I had been thinking about studying marine biology 
dropped out of college to work, go to work as an apprentice at a jewelry manufacturing firm and ended up loving it. And that's how I ended up making jewelry. A um, few years after that, a few decades of working for different jewelers, uh, I made a Chinook salmon ring and decided, you know, this is this is a really cool kind of a thing. And I hadn't seen anything like that around. So I started making some sea life oriented and salmon and trout oriented designs. And just the last, oh, I'd say seven years or so, um, I've been working uh, exclusively for myself. And about half of my work is sea life oriented and, and trout and salmon especially. Gotcha. So cool. So yeah, the Chinook, and I think for me that was what it was, was the Chinook ring or the well, it was salmon or trout or something I saw. It's, and you've got kind of like a salmon or kind of wrapping around the ring. How do you get to like the art? I mean, obviously the jewelry is, is art, but how do you get to the point where you're actually making the, the fish art and making it look kind of realistic? How'd you get into that? Well, I, I start by doing research on the fish. So I'm looking at a lot of images. Um, if I'm doing a custom piece for someone, they might send me a picture of a trophy that they caught so that I can get the spot pattern similar to what's on the fish. And then I, I sketch around that, take some liberties as to positioning. Uh, and off of that sketch, I make a wax carving uh, and uh, very similar to whittling and, and wood. And then I uh, encase that wax carving in plaster, stick that into a kiln, put it into a centrifuge after the wax is melted out of it, and uh, cast uh, silver or gold into the mold. Uh, and, and then it's uh, using different jewelry tools to finish it, engrave it, set gemstones, and, and get it all polished up. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. And you're talking about a process. Obviously, we're not we're not going to cover the whole process today, but you have you're doing these rings now. And I'm not sure how long you've been doing like the fish rings, but you've been doing uh, jewelry for what, like over 40 years. Yeah, I'm, I'm approaching 65 years of age. So, uh, yeah, I've been doing it for a while. And uh, um, but, yeah, the fish rings, I started about 25 years ago, but uh, seriously, really the last seven. Um, and I make different species. Uh, one of my favorites is uh, brook trout. Uh, they're just one of the most beautifully marked fish. And, uh, they, you know, they, they almost look like some kind of a tropical fish. They're, they're amazing to me. Yeah, that's right. And if we wanted to see the brook trout, this ring, is this on a ring? Could we go to your website and take a look? Uh, I've got it on artisanworkshop.com or my Etsy page, which is uh, Sea Life Studio. Uh, so either one of those, uh, you can view them. Uh, but I have other things besides what's uh, there. Um, in fact, I uh, customize these pieces oftentimes for uh, wedding rings. There's a lot of men that uh, won't wear a regular band, but I'll tell you what, they'll wear that Chinook ring as a wedding ring. So. That's right. How does that feel when you, you got people out there wearing, you know, I could just imagine the jewelry, that's cool, but you literally have somebody wearing a wedding ring, something you created. Do you, how does that feel for you? Uh, I, I get a kick out of it, and it's meaningful to me. You know, uh, that's the personal connection for me. To me, jewelry isn't just a, a product or a commodity. You know, I, I think it needs to tell a story and be part of somebody's life and mean something special so i really love that when when i meet people that have purchased my things uh, and uh, oftentimes now if i'm at an art show or something i i uh, run into people uh, that come to my display that are actually wearing one of my pieces so so i get a kick out of that yeah that is that is cool. So so what is out of what you do? You said the brook trout is one of your favorites. What is are there some other ones that are either kind of you see sell more frequently or some of your other favorites? Yeah, I, I make a two salmon and a two trout ring that shows uh two of them close together uh spawning. Uh so so they're they're swimming very close uh, with each other. And there on the band in the back is a gravel bed uh, pattern. Oh wow! And 
uh, those are something that's very, uh, people love those for wedding rings. Um, and then the other thing that I do with a lot of these is I will set a little gemstone into the eye, like a diamond or ruby or emerald. And I find that when you put an eye in it, it really brings it to life. There you go. So now you can, you can add, and, and what does that custom process look like? So if somebody comes in and they say, they see a ring that looks cool, maybe it's one of these spawning pairs of trout or salmon. What does that look like for you? How, how does somebody walk through that process to get something more unique for their partner? Um, I work with them. I interview them about uh, what they're looking for, because in general, people just have a, a vague idea of what they want. And, and once I get a general idea uh, about, uh, for example, uh, what, what kind of metal they would like, what price range, what species, etc., then I make some sketches, uh, email them to them, and uh, work back and forth until we get, get it close to what they would like. Then I'll, then I'll wake, make the uh, wax model and send them pictures of that and get that approved before I actually finish it. Um, but uh, it, it's a very collaborative process. Uh, a couple of years ago, I had a, a fisherman from uh, uh, the Chicago area uh, that uh, um, fishes for the uh, Sea Run Brown Stair. And uh, um, he had quite the uh, picture uh, various photos of of the browns and i worked back and forth with them to the point of getting the spot pattern just so and i cast it in rose gold which looks a lot like a brown trout and uh, th that was a cool piece i think i have a photo of that on my website oh, okay yeah we'll take a look so basically you do a little interview so if somebody's coming in they would look you up call you or submit a form or something like that and then how many times back and forth might you go you know between for somebody to get it just right depends on the person but i'd say average is probably uh three or four times uh in discussing it shooting pictures back and forth and and uh, getting the wax approved that's cool and talk about you mentioned the different metals what, what are the examples of different metals you might use say let's just stick on that wedding ring idea well, um, for wedding rings, it's mostly gold, but I now do quite a few pieces in one of the new uh, Space Age uh, silvers. Uh, the silvers that are available now are really cool. There's one that's alloyed with germanium. Germanium is a metal that's used to harden ball bearings, and they've, they've found that if they combine that in small amounts with silver, that it doesn't tarnish and it's also harder than standard silver and then there's uh, my favorite is called continuum silver which is alloyed with palladium and that's as hard as gold so it's it looks like silver but it's as durable as gold and both of those silvers are a lot less expensive than gold but uh, more expensive than regular silver but but uh, quite affordable and durable so i like working with that Gotcha. So gold. So basically, you have gold as the standard, and that, does the gold cost a little bit more than if you're to do the uh, continuum with the other silver types you're talking about? Yeah, I, I'd say the average uh, wedding ring in gold is between one and two thousand dollars, uh, and and that would be with some gemstones also. Uh, continuum silver is more in the four to eight hundred dollar range. And the the silver with the germanium that I mentioned first uh, runs in the two hundred to four hundred dollar range. Bear Vault keeps wild adventure going and assures your next backcountry trip stays memorable, epic, and safe. Bear Vault builds a rugged polycarbonate locking canister that keeps bears and other wild animals away from your food. This in turn keeps your food safe, keeps bears safe, and keeps you safe. I've got a super uh, funny classic story I've told a few times over the years of the bear stealing my uh, backpack. I left, uh, we were out on a stream um, fishing uh, for uh, sockeye. I left my backpack on the bank, and when I came back, it was it was gone. Left a few nuts in the pack, and, uh, and I lost my backpack that day. 
if I would have had that bear vault, uh, that definitely wouldn't have happened. So there's a good reminder for you and from all levels that if you want, if you're out there hiking around the bears, if, if you're out in the woods, you want to keep your food safe and keep the bears out of your camp, the bear vault can do it for you. And you might not realize this, but this type of thing happens all the time, even to experienced outdoorsmen. The great news for us now is we can experience all the great stuff on these remote trips without the worry. Sleep soundly knowing your vault has sealed the deal for you. The Bear Vault also has some great bonus features like see-through sidewalls so you can find what you're looking for quickly and a wide opening for easy access. And it doubles as a camp stool at a Bear Vault to your backcountry fishing trip today. Check in with the crew at Bear Vault. That's wetflyswing.com slash bear vault. You support this podcast by clicking over to check out Bear Vault. Okay, back to the show. And so basically those uh, those dollars there are for like a completed, are you talking about a completed ring if they're getting gold versus silver? Yeah, that's a completed piece, start to finish. Yeah, yeah, okay. Now I also have uh, a lot of pieces uh, and, and most of my sales are just ordered straight off of uh, my website or from uh, and there's a lot of uh, other sea life jewelry on there too. But you'll see quite a few of my salmon and trout pieces. I have a, a, a grouper in there also. So I make a variety of different things that are ready-made. And uh, so my things are either ready-made like that uh, or they're customized. So I work off of a mold that I already have that's just altered a little bit to personalize it. And that's less expensive than a full custom piece, or it's a full custom. So it's those three categories. Gotcha. So you do a little bit. So yeah, a lot of the sales just come in, they see a ring, they're like, boom, they get it through your website. But uh, but you do a, a little bit of custom as well. So if somebody want, like you said here, if somebody wanted to get a uh, the is it continuum silver? Yes. Continue. Yeah. So if somebody wanted to get that, they could work with you, uh, talk to you on the phone, get the right uh, species, maybe get the right patterings. Let's say, let's just take, for example, we're going to do a steelhead. So if we're going to do a pair, have you ever done any steelhead? I have. Yeah. So I, I do this um, one of two different ways. If somebody likes a ring that they see, but it's not the right species, I can actually sometimes start with that mold, alter it, recarve it, change the tail, the, the kipe, et cetera, on it, and uh, uh, create the species that they're looking for. And, uh, um, or I start from scratch and carve a brand new one. Right, or a brand new one. And what is your process? So the whole process, you mentioned a little bit of it, of going through the wax and stuff. What does that take you? Let's say somebody has a brand new species you've never done before. Let's say, well, there's the first question before we get there. So are there any, like, what if you get some random uh, species you've never done before? Do you, do you dig into that as well? Actually, I really like that. Um, okay. And, and I do, uh, sometimes it goes as far as uh, doing an uh, inlaid body where it's uh, made, where the body is made out of opal. And uh, then the fins and all of that are the metal. So, so yeah, I do some really kind of sculptural pieces that are uh, uh, whatever species people are looking for. There you go. That's cool. So you can do pretty much you can do anything. And that's what sounds like the cool thing about this is although people could buy straight from your website right now, the customizing seems like the really cool thing that you could get something really unique and uh, – and exactly like you said, the steelhead uh, would be one thing we could, you know, you could do. And that's something that I actually enjoy the most. You know, when when I have a mold of something already, uh, it's a bit more of production work, and I don't get a get as much of a kick out of that as creating something brand new. Yeah, and and talk a little bit about your. So we got the rings. We're talking a little about the rings here. You've also got necklaces. Talk about all your, like, the artisan workshop, you know, your website. What else do you have there? Do you have, like, everything? Or what if somebody comes in and says, I want a nose ring or something? Can you can you do a little bit of everything? No, uh, that, that's a new one. I haven't done a nose ring yet. Uh, but, but yes, I, I could. Uh, I'd have to research a li- little bit there. But, uh, yeah, I do, I do a little of everything, actually. My background is as a, a custom jeweler 
for different uh, um, jewelry shops, fine jewelry shops. Uh, and uh, so, for example, in San Jose, I worked for Spectrum Design Jewelers, which uh, does, does some pretty elaborate custom work. Uh, I was there for about 10 years. So, uh, And here in uh, the Portland area, I've been working for different shops. So my background is pretty um, thorough. I'm kind of a generalist so that mm -hmm. I can do uh, uh, pretty much uh, everything, including platinum work. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. And if there's something that I can't do, for example, I don't do CAD. Uh, and that, there's a big trend right now towards CAD cam work uh, in jewelry. Um, so if I have a piece that works out better in CAD, I farm the modeling. Gotcha. Part. Yeah. What is CAD? Well, it's CAD cam, uh, computer aided design. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, so that they mill it out with a, a printer, with a, uh, a cam printer. And uh, um, what I find with a lot of that jewelry, is it's still a bit mechanical. It's not quite as organic mm -hmm. and as alive, I feel, yeah. as, as handcrafted things. And to me, the handcrafting is important. I, uh, that's kind of an art that's being lost now more and more. And uh, um, that's really a shame. So that's one of the reasons why one of my, one of the aspects of what I do right now is I, I train jewelers in that craft. I recently took on an apprentice. I swore I would never take on an apprentice, but I, I finally decided, you know, I got to pass these skills on. I'm, I'm turning 65. I think the last uh, quarter of your life or so should be spent passing on what you know. And uh, so I, I work with other jewelers and teaching them this craft and, and uh, um, so that's a big thing to do now. That's cool. How did you find, I'm curious on the, the apprentice, how did you find that person? Because I know there's probably people listening right now who are do a lot of cool stuff in the arts, and they're probably thinking, wow, this would be a cool thing to learn about. Uh, well, first answer, how did you find your current apprentice, or are you also looking for other people to connect with you? Well, the, um, the nice thing is, since I teach jewelry workshops, when I'm working with uh, a student, I see what what skill level, what drive, uh, what you know. I, I I get to know their personality and see how how that would fit. So uh, my latest apprentice, Jamie, um, she was just a natural fit, um, and uh, she's got the skills. She's uh, uh, got the the vision, uh, and and that makes makes all the difference. And you don't have to try them on as an employee which can be a very frustrating experience um, people are not necessarily what they look like on paper and uh, so since i've worked with her i, I found that out um, i'm not at, as of right now i'm not looking for another additional apprentice but uh, i do offer those workshops so if there's somebody in the general area that's interested they can look me up and we can ar arrange it Okay, perfect. And, and those workshops you are doing those are those all in person? Or are you doing some stuff virtually? Uh, I'm right now. I'm doing everything in person. I was going to try to do that shift during COVID, but uh, and I'm so glad to just get back to the bench and do it there. It's it's yeah. more difficult to do that uh, uh, virtually. Exactly. And uh, in person, it's also you, you know you can purchase a course. It's probably similar uh, with say fly tying. I mean, if you watch something on YouTube, it's different than having an, an instructor there and say, oh, you know, you're holding this a little too tight or uh, why don't you wind this a little t closer and so on. You know, uh, you, you can uh, get into you can kind of direct people individually into what what they're working on and it works out better. Yeah, no, I hear you. I think that. Yeah, it's interesting. You said we've had a couple of flight tying uh, kind of gurus on. Tim Flagler was one on a recent episode, and we talked a little bit about that because he does some classes. And he was actually saying a little bit differently there that on flight tying, obviously having a one on one is definitely the best. But he was saying that sometimes with videos, because he does such a good job with his videos, he has he's a you know a videographer and stuff that he could zoom in on every part and have multiple stages. So he thinks that people actually with his stuff learn better 
seeing his videos than they do. And and the other cool thing is the reach, right? Imagine one video or one course you could reach, you know, uh, you could scale it. But you, it sounds like you're not really thinking about scaling yours necessarily. You, you love the one-on-one stuff. I do. And I, I'm kind of that way with with everything that I do. I'm not really looking at scaling my jewelry business. I, I like the pace I'm going at and I, I'm not looking at uh, mass producing things, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, now, when I teach workshops, I teach up to three students at a time. Um, but I'm finding that uh, I've, I've taught many classes that had 10, even 20 students, and you, you they just can't get in close enough to really see what's going yeah. on. So I, I, get, I get your point about the zooming in. That, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Well, I think we have a, a, a decent feel for what you do. What, what else would you like, you know, if somebody was coming in, if they were listening right now and they're like, okay, this sounds interesting, a uh, uh, new ring, some new jewelry. What's the, what would you recommend? What's the first steps if they want to check out what you have going? Well, I would say visit the website, um, check out Etsy because I have more pieces on Etsy uh, for sale. Um, on my website, I have a larger catalog of things I've done in the past. So if they take a look at that, or actually if they've seen something somewhere or have pictures of jewelry or rings, um, I, I can use that as a starter also. And then they can uh, email me or call me and uh, um, just get the ball rolling, ask a couple of questions, and I'll guide you through it. So So it's... It's a, uh, I like, uh, I like to make people feel comfortable. I'm pretty easy to deal with. And, and uh, so, so uh, that first step can sometimes be a bit intimidating, you know. And also the other thing is if there's really no obligation. You know, the, the first few talks and uh, a rough sketch, I don't charge for that. Oh, that's cool. Uh, uh, once I have an idea of, what we're doing and uh, we do an, uh, uh, then I'll do an estimate and then we'll do a, a serious um, sketch that has a lot of detail to it. And I spend quite a bit of time showing it from different angles and then you, we take it from there. Jackson Hole Fly Company might sound like a new brand to you, but they've actually been designing and manufacturing fly fishing equipment and flies since 1978 at their home base in Wyoming. In 2020, they launched jhflyco.com and started selling gear online directly to anglers all over the country. You can go ahead and take a look at their huge selection of fly rods, reels, lines, accessories, and thousands of fly patterns, all at great prices. I've been loving the new Jackson Hole fly sling uh, recently along with the rod and excited to dig into a few more trips and share some pictures of, uh, of me on the water with the sling pack. Uh, definitely had to retire the old, the old vest this year, so I was excited to, uh, to dig into the sling. Just like Amazon, they'll ship everything directly to your door, saving you money and time. But unlike Amazon, you'll be supporting a great shop and this podcast simply by grabbing a few items. Go ahead, take a peek at what Jackson Hole has going right now. That's jhflyco.com slash swing. Get free shipping on all orders over $50 right now, and you get 25% off your first order. Go to jhflyco.com slash swing, S-W-I-N-G, to get 25% off right now. Check it out right now. You support this podcast in Jackson Hole Fly Company by clicking over through that link. Okay, back to the show. Yeah, no, I get a good feeling about how you do it. I like how it's more more uh, casual, easygoing, it sounds like. Well, we'll see from this episode how many people, you know, you, you will, maybe we'll get you overloaded here, but uh, <laughs> we'll do our best to, to send a few people your way. Uh, and But I'm curious on, I want to switch a little bit and go into, just a little bit back into your history because I know... Uh, you've got a little bit of an accent there. I'm curious about that, kind of where you came over from. It sounds like you, you maybe were here early as a kid. But um, also uh, uh, Jacques Cousteau, I know, is a big influencer. And he was a big person that I remember as a youngster. And probably some younger kids probably don't know about Jacques. I'll, I'll use this opportunity to put a link of a video to uh, Jacques Cousteau oh, that's in the show great. notes. But uh, tell me about Jacques. What, what did he mean to you as you know from what he did? Well... I was really inspired to be
become a marine biologist uh, by watching uh, his uh, episodes. He was kind of the the father of marine biology in a way, at least in popular culture. Uh, and uh, forget what the name of his boat was. He had this. Oh right, the, I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah he had this uh, weekly TV show. Uh, and I found it absolutely fascinating. Um, I, I ended up not studying marine biology, but I almost wish I had, because if I had done so in the 1970s, I would have been that first crop of marine biologists that uh, ended up uh, becoming very uh, um, kind of the, the groundbreakers in that whole field. And uh, um, But during that time also, the older generation was telling me, you want to be a marine biologist? You think you're going to be Jacques Cousteau? <laughs> well, you, you, you'll never make it, you know. But uh, so, so it goes to show you, you know, sometimes you should just follow your dreams. So I, I guess in a way, you know, I, I, I go fishing. I love the uh, I'm very inquisitive about what's going on there. Uh, as I'm fishing and and uh, um, and then depicting the the animals and my jewelry, I guess I am kind of a marine biologist. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, as far as where I'm from, I I was born in Germany. Uh, I grew up there. Uh, was born in Cologne. Lived in southern Germany. Uh, moved here when I was 13. Um, but in Germany already, I remember being really fascinated with the idea of fishing. But in, in Europe, it's a bit more difficult because uh, the waters are many times spoken for, you know. They're hereditary waters as they have hereditary hunting rights also that go back hundreds of years. So for every municipality, every township, you have to have a separate fishing license and and so on. So it's it's a bit difficult. At least that's the way it was back then. Maybe it's changed now. But anyways, I came over here and right away, moving to California at the time, uh, that's one of the first things I wanted to do. I wanted to go fishing. I, I read uh, Ray Cannon's How to Fish the Pacific Coast. And that really got me inspired to, to fish back then. And then we had these ponds around town. Um, interesting story. There was a little creek that ran through San Jose. So it goes through this industrial city into uh, uh, the bay by Alviso, which has a huge garbage dump. So this is not mm. your glorious river. It was yeah. a drainage ditch. One winter, the, the uh, flood control berms washed out. I paraded down there with my fishing pole and a spoon on it, thinking, well, you know, steelhead and salmon might come up here. <laughs> and I caught a salmon. You know? Oh, wow. So these, uh, these experiences really egged me on and formed me and and uh, that, that's, wow. that's what i'm still enjoying do you remember was that a chinook salmon do you remember what species you know i didn't know that much about it back then i yeah. think not looking back now i think it was a coho it was, oh, coho. i think it was a small coho uh and uh it was very red so it was ready yeah definitely ready to spawn and uh yeah it was it was very interesting that's cool. What was it like when you came over? I can imagine at 13, you know, that uh, kind of a amazing, you know, it's a crazy time for some kids. But, I mean, moving over here, what did that feel like when you got over to California in, in you know, that first year? Uh, I absolutely loved it. In Germany, the weather is similar to the Northwest. Um, and a lot of gray, a lot of rain. And we came over in March and uh, drove down from the airport, this wide highway and this boat of a car instead of our little clown cars in Europe. <laughs> and uh, uh, the air was balmy. And uh, the next morning when the sun came up, we saw palm trees. And I thought, Amazing. I, I, thought I was in heaven, you know. So, um, yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed it. Being a teenager was a bit of a, an adjustment. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was inspiring to me. So... And the outdoors, uh, the the possibilities here in the states are just uh, much more extensive than they are uh, in Europe, where everything's built up. So right. 
You have to travel right. to Europe to get out into nature. That's right. How'd you get up? How'd you move from uh, California? What brought you up to Oregon or Portland? Well, uh, loved it. Um, I uh, met uh, a woman, moved up here 17 years ago now, 18 years ago, uh, and uh, was married about, uh, what is it, 16 years ago now. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Her name is Jeannie. She is now a retired English teacher. Uh, I've got uh, two grandkids now, oh, uh, wow. three, three and a five-year-old that I took fishing for the first time this last summer. So that was exciting. That is exciting. Did you uh, did you make the ring for Jeannie? Uh, I did, yes. And yeah. uh, uh, she still kicked me about this because uh, I finished it the morning of our wedding. So, oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> What what was the describe that ring? What could you describe? Was it like we're talking about a gold ring? Or? Yeah, this one is a, is different. It's uh, she loves Art Nouveau and Art Deco style jewelry, and this is an Art Deco ring that I designed that has white gold and uh, rose gold in it with uh, small little diamonds, and um, uh, it's a really cool design. Nothing having to do with uh, trout or salmon. Gotcha, gotcha. No, that's cool. Right on. This is this is cool, Thomas. You've got uh, you got a cool story here, and um, it's uh, it's inspiring. And because it sounds like you are a, you would be a cool person to connect with, and uh, hopefully some people listening, you know, will, will head your way. And I know there's some people in the Northwest, so you might even get some new, maybe a new apprentice, uh, somebody listening right now who's interested. So we'll, we'll have to see how that goes, and maybe you could let me know if that happens uh, down the line. I will definitely tell you. A couple more things. Uh, yeah. Uh, anybody that purchases on Etsy or on my website uh, something that's in stock for the first year, I'm going to do- make a donation of uh, 20% of that price to Trout Unlimited. Um, and then I wanted to mention a little pointer. Um, I went to the 50th uh, anniversary symposium of the International Fly Fishers in Bend a couple of years back. And I had a display there at the trade show, and uh, I saw the uh, uh, competitive fly tires there. I found that really interesting. And that got me thinking, you know, um, a person could actually use um, little gemstones in their designs, and they're not necessarily expensive. For example, you could use, uh, I have these little tiny cat's eye moonstones that uh, uh, have a cat's eye traveling across it, similar similar to a tiger's eye. I don't know if you're familiar with that uh, gemstone, but um, uh, so they're tiny, about three millimeters or so. And uh, you can tie them in by using a little burr, say from Harbor Freight. You can score a little line around the circumference of it and then tie that in with wire or thread so you could create uh, some cat's eye eyeballs on your pieces or, you know, you can do that with other other cabochon type of gemstones. Not the faceted ones maybe, but definitely uh, cabochons. So I thought that might be a cool interface between jewelry and fly tying. Yeah. Yeah, no, that would. I think that's something maybe if somebody's interested, they could... You know, give you a call or check in with you more and find out more information on that. Is that something, could we see anything like you're talking about there? Is that something new that you're just thinking about? Uh, I don't have any pictures posted of that, but I could post something on my website. I think I'll go ahead and do that. By the time this podcast airs, I'll have that posted. Okay, good. Yeah. Good, yeah, and we'll and where would we set? Can we create a? Uh, let's see, I could just make something right now. I'll make a link to direct them over there. Um, we'll just call it. Uh, now you're talking about the cat's eye, right? Is that how would you describe this this thing you're talking about here? It's a semi-translucent stone, so it's kind of silvery looking. It's kind of like uh, frosted glass in appearance, except yeah. except bright. It's got a high dome to it. But it has this line of a bright reflection that travels as you turn it. That um, that's why they call it a cat's eye. Um, so it's a, it's a really cool look. Not that that necessarily would attract fish, but it it might attract fishermen. That's good. 
Okay. Well, let's. Uh, I'll put a link out at wetflyswing.com slash cat's eye. And we'll put a direct one to this. When you get that up, I'll put a link out to that. And then everybody can just go in the show notes and take a look at your website, obviously. But we'll try to direct them to there more specifically. Um, before we get out here, I want to check just on overall. It sounds like you have tons of knowledge, you know, years and years of all this. If somebody other than what you have going, which sounds like that's a good start, say you, they didn't have you didn't have enough room for somebody to get in. Where else would you send somebody to learn more about uh, kind of this kind of the artisan type jewelry? I mean, there must be thousands and thousands of websites. Where, like, did you have a mentor, or what do you tell somebody if they ask you that? Yeah, I, I had uh, multiple mentors. Um, there's two things that I encourage people to look at. If they're local here in the general Portland area, the Multnomah Art Center is great for classes. Uh, so they have beginning classes there. Uh, oh, cool. And then um, if um, somebody is interested in learning uh, uh, about uh, 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 online courses and such, mm -hmm. uh, there, there's two resources. One is riograndecom and they are both a provider of tools and parts for the jewelry industry. Uh, and also they have a vast catalog of resources of uh, um, teaching tapes, uh, videos, etc. And the other one that's a great resource for budding jewelers is gnoxon.com. That's G A N. O K S I N, and that's a vast uh, network of um, jewelers that mentor each other, and uh, they have a large catalog of classes available through that also. Oh, there you go. And the first one was Rio. Was that? Uh, uh, can you spell that one? The first Rio was that yeah. Rio Grande. Yes, Rio Grande. R I O G R A N D E dot com. Oh, perfect. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. So we'll, we'll put links out to those in the show notes. And then, like you said, the just art centers, that's a, another more general place people could start. So, okay, Thomas, well, in the next uh, kind of year, you've kind of alluded a little bit of this, but anything else you want to give a shout out to you have going with yourself, either the business or personally you want to give a heads up on? Yeah, I'm kind of uh, excited. We're going to take a road trip out to Montana this year, just a family vacation but I'm going to take a pocket full of my uh, trout pieces with me, and I'm going to see if I can connect with some galleries in, in Montana, maybe whitefish or something, and uh, uh, see how that goes. Maybe if some of your listeners have some tips, or maybe someone uh, um, owns a gallery or fly shop up there, I'd love to drop by and, and take a look at that. Um, I do sell through some of the local coastal galleries here, in uh, Oregon, and I do art shows in the uh, in Oregon and Washington, and uh, that's always a blast for me because I, I love that personal connection. You know, if you're just doing online stuff, you kind of lose lose touch with that. It's uh, to get that personal feedback. I think is just all important. Yeah, no, I think that's a great idea. Yeah, I think the fly shops <clears throat> is a great example. If you can get your product out there in some of these local fly shops, I could see that as a hot item, you know, sitting right, sitting right there next to the cash register, you know, some cool rigs, some cool fish jewelry. And, then, and here in the story, that's the cool thing, right? Is this isn't just some some cheap knockoff thing, you know what I mean? This is something that you put, spent your life crafting. And, and the customization is also a huge, right? That's, that's amazing. Well, it's it's all in the details also. There's, there's a lot of, um, you can find some cheap um, uh, silver jewelry out there, but you can tell the difference. Um, it, it, uh, I think it makes a difference when something is handcrafted versus pumped out by a machine. Yeah, exactly. No, that's great. Well, well, Thomas, this has been a lot of fun today. I will send everybody out to uh, artisanworkshop.com if they have questions for you. And uh, yeah, thanks for everything today. This has been really cool giving us, this is definitely a unique episode. I think this, we've had some artists on, plenty of artists. Uh, in fact, we had Ray Troll on, who's a f kind of a famous fish artist too, that does some cool stuff. But um, this is the first jewelry we've, uh, artist we've had. So I, I want to thank you for coming on today and sharing your, your wisdom here. Well, thank you, Dave. I appreciate the opportunity, and I'm thrilled to be on your show. So there you go. Show notes, links, and everything else, wetflyswing.com slash 312. 302 will get you the good stuff. 
before we get out of here, I want to let you know you can subscribe to this episode, wetflyswing.com slash subscribe. Check it out right now and you will get updated when that next episode goes live. And that next episode is going to be a good one. We've got Taylor, Taylor Strite, all the way down, all the way home from New Mexico is here to share a little bit of the behind the scenes in that unique state. Really cool episode. This is definitely a fun one. Hope you get a chance to check it out. Click that subscribe button. You'll get updated and you'll hear this next episode when it goes live. All right, I'm going to let you get out of here and I hope you have a good night wherever you are, a good day or a good afternoon. And looking forward to catching you online or maybe on the water. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.